Hello, everybody. We're just letting everybody in. Uh, we'll spend a couple of minutes doing that, and then we'll get started. People are streaming in the door. We're going to let them get in. And then we will uh, start up the program in just a minute or two. Thanks for waiting. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar uh, sponsored by the Turner Center, uh, Making It Pencil. Uh, I'm Bill Fulton, I'm a fellow at the Turner Center, uh, among other things, and I'd like to welcome you here today. I just wanna, I'm about to introduce our panelists and we'll get started, I'll, I'll describe the format. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, there will be a Q and A period, and when, uh, if you have a question, Please remember to put it in the Q&A uh, uh, button down at the bottom rather than the chat button. If you have a general question about the uh, about what's going about the format or something, the chat is okay. But please put the questions in the Q&A. Also, uh, this is being recorded, and we will send the link out to everybody who registered for today's event. Um, <clears throat> making it pencil is an update. Uh, uh, there's a tool, there's a new report and a tool out from the Turner Center about how uh, anybody can uh, demystify development math. Uh, so what we're going to do today is David Garcia, the policy director at uh, the Turner Center, is going to talk about this new tool and talk about this new report. Then we're going to have a conversation with three panelists, um, Jonathan Fern, the head of development at Oak Impact Group in the Bay Area. Uh, Mott Smith, principal of Civid Enterprise uh, Development in Los Angeles. He's also one of the founders, co-founders of the Council of Infill Builders and an adjunct professor of real estate at, at the Price School at University of Southern California. And Heidi Von Blum, the director of planning for the city of San Diego. Welcome to all of you today. Um, what we're going to do first is spend the next 15 or so minutes uh, having uh, David Garcia go over uh, this update of 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 making it pencil uh, and talking about the online tool that anybody can use to try to figure out what projects pencil and don't. And after that, I'll ask some questions of um, of our panelists, and then we'll turn it over to your questions. So to begin with, I'll turn it over to David Garcia. David, hello. Hey, Bill. Thank you for uh, the introduction and the handoff, and also thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, so as uh, as Bill mentioned earlier, you know, in uh, in 2019, we released our first Making It Pencil Brief with a goal of providing a resource to policymakers, advocates, and really anyone involved in housing conversations who wanted or needed a baseline understanding of how housing gets built by the private market. And since 2019, a lot has changed in the real estate world, but the need to build more housing is the same, if not greater. So we decided that we needed to refresh our original Making It Pencil project to demonstrate how these changes are impacting the ability of the market to deliver new housing. 
Um, so today, I'm going to walk you through our update, updated development math work uh, before handing it back over to Bill to hear from our panel who can confirm or, or correct uh, what I am saying in this presentation and hopefully give you some real world examples. So um, next slide, please. So at its core, this work aims to unpack the steps that a developer undertakes to finance and build new housing at the on the private market and how those steps are impacted by policy choices and market conditions. And so we did this by creating a detailed case study uh, pro forma for a handful of key markets across the state of California, specifically for market rate construction, uh, which makes up the vast majority of new housing built in the United States. Uh, these case studies were informed by conversations with developers, um, with uh, um, different consultants, financial advisors in each of these markets in order in order to make sure that we had a reasonably comprehensive understanding of the real estate market as it works today. And so the markets we studied for this project were both in the East and South Bay areas uh, of the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as the West side of Los Angeles and the core of Sacramento. While we only looked at these specific markets, the principles that we'll be going over today are true for market rate real estate development more, more broadly. Next slide, please. And so we have a handful of questions that we want to uh, try to answer, not just with uh, this presentation today, but with our work more broadly in this space. So first is really how costs for new construction are calculated. We know it's expensive to build, but what goes into those expenses and what components of new development are, are the most expensive? It's also important to break down uh, who pays for these projects. Developers don't generally use their own money. They leverage debt from banks and equity from investors to make new housing work. But each of these sources has different return expectations that a developer must meet in order to obtain financing. We'll, we'll try to answer those questions today too. We also look at how rents are determined and what role they play in project feasibility. And then lastly, we look at what policymakers can do to change this math for, for better or worse. Next slide. So for today's presentation, we're gonna focus on one specific case study uh, that we are calling Turner Terrace. And so here's what you need to know about this, this project. Um, first of all, it is a market rate for rent project, which means that there are no uh, subsidies as part of the financing here and no requirement for on-site affordability. This is in a strong East Bay location. So think uh, Emeryville, uh, Uptown Oakland or Rockridge. And the project itself is 120 units in a mixture of studios, one bedrooms and two bedroom apartments. We've also assumed that we would need to provide uh, the same number of parking spaces as units, so 120 parking spaces or a one-to-one -one parking ratio. We've also penciled in about 1,500 square feet of ground floor retail space, which is about the uh, size of a small coffee shop. And then um, perhaps uh, most importantly, you know, Turner Terrace is a mid-rise apartment building or something known as a five over one, which refers to the construction typology where there's a concrete podium on the ground floors with multiple floors of wood framed construction above which is how uh, most mid-rise apartments are built today. And so this is important to note because if Turner Terrace were a high rise, say 10 or 20 stories, it would be built with uh, concrete and steel and therefore it'd be a lot more expensive. Um, on the other hand, if Turner Terrace were say a uh, mixture of, of townhomes or smaller buildings, um, we wouldn't be using uh, as much concrete. We could use all wood framing and it would be uh, less, less expensive uh, to build. Um, next slide, please. And so in addition to designing Turner Terrace, we also need to know a bit about the project itself, uh, the project site itself, so that we can know how much is, it's going to cost to build. So as part of our exercise, we've made a series of assumptions about our project site and the applicable local policies, which I'll walk through quickly now. Um, first, the site itself. So we've assumed that we have been fortunate enough to have a site that does not require uh, demolition. So there's no existing buildings that need to be knocked down um, or Environmental remediation. So there's no, for example, underground storage tanks that need to be removed or contaminated soil that needs to be addressed. We've also assumed that the site project is eligible for streamlined environmental clearances, either because the city we're working in uh, doesn't require it or that we've been able to use an exemption of some kind. Um, given these assumptions, we've determined that the land itself will cost about $8 million. And this is based on conversations with developers who've got checked for us what a what this kind of a clean site would go for in, in a strong market. Um, one important thing to note is that while we plugged in a number into our pro forma for the land price, that's not how it always works in reality. In practice, the price of land um, is most of the time dictated by something called the residual land value, 
which is essentially the amount that a developer can uh, afford to pay for the land after estimating total development costs without pushing the project into infeasibility. And so um, this uh, residual land value might not actually be enough to entice a landowner to sell the property, especially if they're making a, a profit on an existing use, for example, a, a surface parking lot. Um, in addition to cost assumptions, we made a number of policy assumptions, including that, uh, again, there is no inclusionary requirement or requirement to pay in any sort of affordable housing fee. We've assumed that there are no offsite infrastructure improvements required, so we don't need to upgrade the sewer lateral or anything like that, thankfully, and that there are no uh, exactions uh, that the city is requiring as a condition of approval for the project. And the last thing I'll mention is that we've also assumed $40,000 per unit for residential impact fees. Now, um, this could be higher or lower depending on the jurisdiction you're in, um, but for this project and this exercise, we've assumed uh, $40,000 per unit. Um, next slide, please. So uh, now that we know what our project looks like and what the development conditions are gonna be, we can come up with a cost estimate. So here we've broken down the cost into three specific categories that I'll walk through now. The first is land. So I mentioned earlier that the price is roughly $8 million, but included in the price of land on this uh, graph is that um, it are, are things like closing costs and due diligence. So things like soil tests and whatnot uh, to uh, confirm the condition of the land. Next slide. So the bulk of our project is going to be made up of hard costs, which uh, here are 65% of the total project costs. And these are basically the things that are associated with the physical construction of the project. So things like materials, wages, uh, and contingencies in case uh, our, our cost, we have cost overruns. And so this, um, this amount, again, makes up the bulk of our overall cost. Next slide. And then at about $20 million, we have something called soft costs. And so these are essentially the costs that are associated with the, the design and implementation of the project, but not the physical construction. So think of things like uh, the amount we have to pay uh, to our architects and engineers to design the project, the taxes that we pay uh, while the project is under construction, um, and uh, insurance on the property as well. There's also uh, an amount that is uh, allocated to the developer overhead, known as a developer fee. We've calculated that at about 3% of total cost. And this, this goes to pay for the staff time uh, for the developer to uh, manage the project while it's going through entitlements and going through construction. Next uh, slide, please. So now that we know uh, the costs of Turner Terrace, we have to figure out how to pay for building this project. And so as mentioned earlier, developers generally don't use their own money to build these projects. They get financing from two sources, uh, debt in the form of a loan from a bank, and equity, which is a private uh, investor who will cover what the bank won't cover. So each of these partners has a specific uh, return metric that our project must be able to meet in order to uh, obtain financing, in order for them to feel comfortable enough to give us money to build Turner Terrace. So I'm going to walk through some of those metrics now. Next slide. So first, let's start with our bank. So much like buying a house, the bank will give us most of our funding, but not all of it. So we've determined that we can likely obtain roughly 55% of our project cost from a bank loan. So uh, this is a ratio called uh, loan to cost. And this 55% ratio is lower than what we've seen historically. So when we first did this work in 2019, we had a loan, a loan to cost of 65%. And before that, developers uh, could get as high as 70 to 75% of their costs covered through loans. But today, because projects are so expensive and risky, the bank will only give us a little more than half of what we need. Um, this is important because bank debt is generally less expensive than equity, which means that the less the bank will give us, the more expensive our financing will be. Um, so Turner Terrace's 55% loan to cost means that uh, I, as the developer, would need to raise about $36 uh, million in private money uh, to fill the gap left by uh, what the bank uh, is not going to pay for. Next slide, please. And so before getting into uh, the return requirements that uh, equity commands, I want to talk a little bit about who could actually invest in Turner Terrace or who invests in residential real estate more broadly. And so the, the terms equity and investor are very broad and nebulous. And so it's important to understand who these players are and what their motivations are. 
Um, and generally speaking, you know, these groups, these private equity players, they don't have to invest in new housing. They can invest in anywhere they want as they are part of what we refer to as a global pool of capital, which means that their investments can really go anywhere to maximize risk-adjusted returns. So for example, uh, private equity companies are, are one of the major sources of uh, equity financing for new residential. Um, and they typically invest in all manners of real estate uh, and in any part of the country, right? So if it becomes too risky or costly to invest in California, they can shift their investments to uh, Texas or other states where the perceived risk of development is lower. Um, in addition to private equity, there are also pension funds like uh, CalPERS or other unions who use real estate investments to round out their members' pension growth. Um, there's also insurance groups that put money into broad portfolio investments, uh, which again includes uh, residential real estate. So long story short, these groups all need to ensure that their investments can be trusted to provide a return commensurate with the risk that they are taking. Next slide, please. So there are several ways that we can measure uh, return and determine whether or not our project will be able to attract investment. But for the purposes of this exercise, we're going to focus on something called return on cost. So return on cost basically compares the cost to build and manage Turner Terrace against the revenue that it will generate. So with return on cost, we can compare it to something called capitalization rates, which measures the return one can expect by, say, purchasing an existing building nearby. And so basically, what we're trying to determine by comparing these two metrics is whether or not it's worth the time and trouble of developing a new building compared to the return of simply buying uh, an existing building nearby. And if it's not, then there's really no motivation to build it as a developer and no interest from uh, investors and banks to provide financing for, for this project. Next slide. So when we compare return on cost to cap rates, what are we actually looking for? Uh, well, it depends. Each market is different, but we've determined that for Turner Terrace to work, we need to demonstrate a return on cost that is roughly one percentage point higher than cap rates. This is uh, this is something we call the spread. Um, and this is smaller than it was in 2019 when we first did this report. Or I should say that the spread is actually larger, um, where developers could expect to still attract capital with just a half percentage point spread between return on cost and cap rates. Uh, but because costs and risk have increased since 2019, investors today are looking for something closer to a full percentage point higher in order to be comfortable to give our project money. Uh, next slide, please. So in our market, we know that cap rates for a project like Turner Terrace are about 5%, which means that Turner Terrace needs to have a return on cost of roughly 6% to attract investment. So based on the cost to build and the rents we expect to charge, which we'll talk a little bit more in a few slides, we can come up with our return on cost. Next slide. And you can see here that our return on cost is 4.78, which is not only uh, anywhere close to the 6% threshold uh, we've set ourselves, but it's not even uh, uh, comparable to, to cap rates. And so it's very likely, next slide, that Turner Terrace just does not get built because there is uh, really, you know, it's not anywhere close to feasibility based on the metrics that we've um, we've laid out today. And so, um, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier uh, were that, you know, the majority of this project will derive its revenue from rents charged to tenants. And so we wanted to also test what different rent levels look like in terms of feasibility. So um, next slide. First, we looked at uh, what would happen if we set rents at more affordable levels. So for example, we looked at setting rents at, let's say uh, a little over $2,000 per month for a one bedroom at Turner Terrace, uh, which is roughly affordable to a person, uh, a one person household making area median income in the East Bay. Um, while it is more affordable, unfortunately this tracks our return on cost uh, down very significantly. If you'll recall uh, before, it was 4.78 uh, based on the original rents that we inputted, but with um, more affordable rents, it actually brings down feasibility much, much lower. Um, next slide. So um, at, this is what we actually used in our performa case study was $3,500 a month for a, a one, one bedroom, which is roughly what uh, the market study says our brand new development could command. But um, uh, this is pretty high, right? Like this is, uh, and as we demonstrated earlier, even at these price points, the project still doesn't really pencil out. So then we asked ourselves, okay, what, uh, what price point do revenues actually justify the cost? So um, next slide, please. 
if you if we looked at our project for one bedroom uh, uh, rents and we put them all the way up to let's say four thousand dollars per month at that price point we actually do get a return on cost um, that we think will attract investment but there's a big problem is that no one can actually pay that amount and so uh, for example we can't just pencil in that people will pay a certain amount into our project or for for our um, for our rental revenue we need to back that up with a um, uh, with a market study that shows that there is a market for four thousand dollar one bedrooms for Turner Terrace, and unfortunately, um, there is not. So we can't just raise revenues to the point where we can cover our project costs. So that leads us to the next question: If we can't simply raise revenues from rents, how do we bring down costs? And this is where policymakers come in. So um, you know, by helping to bring down the cost curve, uh, policymakers can help projects work better. And so we looked at a series of uh, potential policy changes to see if we could get Turner Terrace to feasibility. So we looked at four things, um, impact fees, uh, allowed density, uh, parking, and uh, and reducing general hard costs. And, and we walked through each of these to see if we could get Turner Terrace to work. So um, next slide. Here we've reduced our impact fees from $40,000 per unit all the way down to $10,000 per unit. Um, this uh, does get us a little bit better of a return on cost as measured by the red uh, bar on the graph. Um, next slide. On top of that, if we were to also reduce the required amount of parking, that goes a long way towards reducing our hard costs. It can cost anywhere from fifty dollars to $80,000 per parking space. And to the extent that we can reduce the amount of parking on site, that can reduce our costs and help us get closer to feasibility. Next slide. In addition to that, if we were to allow for more homes to be built on this site, this could help with revenue as well. Um, and uh, and it does get us a bit closer to that 6% threshold that we mentioned earlier, but still not quite there. Um, next slide. And if we were to, let's say, reduce our hard cost by 10%, that does get us to that uh, magic 6% number that we've uh, uh, said we need to get to in order for this project to work out. Um, reducing hard costs is kind of a broad nebulous policy uh, uh, choice, but uh, these this can be achieved by, for example, expediting approvals or streamlining the review process to reduce uh, the potential of costs going up in the future. Also by pursuing um, different types of um, construction uh, innovations that may help bring down costs. For example, offsite industrialized construction has, has some promise there. Um, this is uh, this also works in reverse, right? So for example, if we were to increase our fees from 40,000 to say $80,000 per unit, which um, is not that big of a stretch in some cities, um, you would see the bar graph going in the opposite direction. So it's important to note that while policymakers have the ability to make projects work better, they could also perhaps inadvertently make projects work um, not as well uh, through uh, other policies that uh, turn the cost curve the, in the wrong direction. And so um, next slide. So I'm going to stop there. Um, hopefully this has been uh, useful and I look forward to the panel conversation to dig in what this looks like in the real world. But I did want to note that um, you know you can access this information on our website, and we have several more analyses forthcoming using these same resources. So, for example, we're going to take the same uh, pro forma approach to look at missing middle housing typologies, so things like duplexes, triplexes, small apartments. What does the math look like for these kinds of projects? We're also going to test out policies for uh, for facilitating more. Uh, housing that is affordable to middle-income households with, without direct subsidy? What are the policy levers we can use there to make more, let's say, 80% to 120% AMI affordability work? Um, so please be on the lookout for, for that in the future, and, and please feel free to, to visit our, our website for, for more information. And with that, I'll hand it over to Bill and the panel to uh, to see what I got right, what I missed, and, uh, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, David. Um... Before we go to the panelists, um, there are a number of questions for you about the presentation. So let me just go through those as quick, some of these as quickly as I can. We'll get to all of the questions. Uh, if you have a question, please again, put it in the Q&A, not in the chat. Um, uh, uh, first of all, all of this material, the PowerPoint, the video, um, the interactive tool, that either is all or will be on the Turner website, right? Right, David? Correct. Correct. Yeah, this is all yeah, available okay. now, and I think it's been posted in the chat. So uh, we they, we have an interactive tool 
um, that walks through a lot of the concepts I walk through, but there, there's also a full report that accompanies right. that tool that okay. has a lot more detail as well. Let's just go through a couple of these questions. Um, uh, and again, please put it in the Q&A, not in the chat. I just saw another question come into the Q&A. Um, uh, one question was the 40K per unit for impact fees, does that include permit fees? Yeah, so this is all fees, so the full fee stack. Um, and so okay. this is, right. in some cases, I'll, I'll let the um, the practitioners on the panel opine on this, but in some cases, this is quite optimistic. And in many jurisdictions, you will see um, total fees, including permit fees, school fees, okay. utility code fees, they'll be much higher than that. All right. Again, please put the questions in the Q&A, not the chat. Um, what's your formula? Uh, is what's your formula for calculating return on costs? Is it NOI slash total development cost? Uh, roughly, yeah. Um, and roughly. so I will say a lot of these really technical questions, um, they can be found in the report itself. Okay. So I'll drop All a right. link okay. in, into there. All right. Um, so let's uh, come back to these specific questions for you uh, at, at the end of this uh, conversation, if we have time. Uh, and move back to and go to the panelists. Let me begin. Again, our panelists are Jonathan Fern from Oak Impact Group, Mott Smith from Civit Enter Enterprise Development, and Heidi von Blum, the director of the uh, director of planning for the city of San Diego. Let's begin with Jonathan. Um, Jonathan, you're a Bay Area developer. This is what we saw was a Bay Area um, uh, plan. Uh, um, how accurate is David's assessment here? Is this pretty? Is this pretty much the way it works in the real world there in the East Bay, or are there any particular things that that you think should be changed or up, updated in some way? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, what David has, has outlined here is pretty accurate. Um, you know, I was kind of going through the model, and I think, you know, um, we have to have a baseline here. But yeah, I think it's it's rare that you would see a project uh, that has all those assumptions in terms of <laughs> no demo, you know, no environmental uh, remediation <laughs> necessary, no uh, inclusionary, just about every project will have that in the Bay Area. Um, the other thing I think uh, that needs mentioning is um, parking, uh, you know, those assume the one to one ratio. When you start talking about all the back of house stuff you have to get the lobbies and stuff like that oftentimes you have to go underground and that can really cause your projects to even escalate even further um but you know i think we have to really kind of just take a, a kind of conservative approach in this analysis and i think it's it's pretty right i think the the other thing i'll say related to, to land i think that is a that is a, a kind of a a, a squishy issue uh, if you will um you know there there was an assumption made in the model just of kind of what a land price would be David spoke to a land residual, which is a lot of how developers kind of figure out what land may be worth. Um, I think it's been a challenge these days uh, because uh, developers are scrambling to kind of understand and, and value what, what land may be worth given what the uh, top line revenues are and all of the costs uh, that kind of go into a development. And so um, I think it, it, more so than just having a land residual, um, landowners also, just like a property owner, somebody who owns their own home, has an idea about what their land is worth. And I think, you know, <laughs> they will likely not trade or will be reluctant to trade uh, if they don't get that kind of perceived number. And I think that's another thing that kind of plays into the challenges of getting projects off the ground. So, uh, but all in all, I think it's it's a, it's a great model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you you make a good point that landowners often have in their head their idea of how much their land is worth. That may not be accurate given current market conditions. So sometimes projects don't go for two reasons. One is they may have a low cost basis and a, and and they have a, a revenue source already, like a parking lot, or they just don't want to compromise on the price because they they think they may not need the money now and they may think that. That the that the land is more than it's worth. I'm wondering, Jonathan, if you could also talk about, you know, David talked a lot about um, all the variables, both in the market and in policy, that could move the needle from infeasibility to feasibility, or the reverse. And I'm wondering if you, in your experience, whether you have seen whether whether you could speak to a particular example in your experience about um, about a. Uh, uh, a market or policy variable that shifted and and uh, derailed or killed a project you were you were hoping to build. I'm, I imagine you've got many examples, but I'm just kind of curious. For a developer, what does that look like? What kinds of things? 
Yeah, I mean, I I think that um, you know, the, the, there are, there 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 are a number of things. Uh, you know, I I think the what has been um, recent, and I mean, in the last like three years, the the the, the profound impact of the of the of the of the COVID pandemic uh, really can't be you know um, uh, understated. And you know, I think the kind of the requisite. Uh, Increase in interest rates have also had uh, dramatic impacts on the viability of real estate. I think one of the things David mentioned was, you know, um, equity requirements, and you know, as the in as interest rates have increased uh, and the the so called kind of risk free rate has increased, people are basically comparing what they can get, you know, for basically just putting money into treasuries and you know a risky kind of endeavor like a real estate project and. Uh, because of that, um, you know the the cost uh, or or um, the the returns that a developer needs to to return to a, an investor have gone up, um, and what has also gone down uh, certainly in the Bay Area has been rents. Um, rents have gone down, and, and those rents that even have kind of maybe come back to pre-COVID levels. Um, what we're seeing in the Bay Area, at least, is that you can't really tell a great rent growth story, which you can in other areas of of the of the nation. And so, uh, just those two things themselves um, really have impacted the ability uh, of a lot of developments to get off the ground. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just those kind of policy shifts alone have really impacted development. Yeah, interesting, and interesting that 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 the debt equity ratio changed so much. During COVID, sure. and that that must make it much more difficult to do a deal than it than it did before. I'm sure. That's absolutely um, right. Uh, Matt, uh, you're a developer in LA, um, a, a similar but different market uh, than yeah. we see in the East Bay here. I'm kind of wondering, uh, uh, is this how close is this to what you see going on in LA today? Very similar. I mean, you you and Jonathan both made a, a bunch of great points. And by the way, I want to give Jonathan a shout out. He is also a board member of the Council for Linfield Builders. So <laughs> we're representing North and South today. Um, you know, the, uh, if, if if I can if I can uh, answer a slightly different question than you asked, Bill, um, to to build well, of on course, some of the conversation. Of course, Mott, that's what you're going to do. I know you, right? <laughs> Whatever I ask, you're going to you're going to answer the question you want to answer. You know, well, I just want to I want to build on what you and Jonathan um, were, were were talking about with respect to land residual and the change in the debt equity environment, et cetera. Um, I should say that in LA, that debt equity, um, what we call the loan to value ratio that's available for projects, which is the amount of, of the total cost, which you can finance with debt, um, that is actually coming down even more dramatically here than in Northern California because of the measure ULA transfer tax, which uh, however you feel about using transfer taxes as a way of generating revenues for, for good causes like affordable housing, um, this one was very poorly designed, unfortunately, and um, also measure impacts ULA. Measure, measure ULA. ULA. Yeah, uh -huh. it, 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 it um, would charge banks five and a half percent to foreclose on a property and then charge banks five and a half percent to sell that foreclosed property. So that reduces the loan to value that a bank is willing to invest uh, or lend on a, a project in LA by a, an additional 11% of the total capital stack. So if we're at 55% statewide, think more 45% in LA. Um, so this is just a disaster for, for new projects that rely on debt finance, financing. I also and, want to say, mm -hmm. oh, go, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 no. You uh, keep going. This is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I was, I was, I was also going to add that, um, you know, again, looking at project feasibility per se is a useful exercise as the Turner Center has done mm. here. And I love this presentation. It's very, it's very simple, clear, and and as Jonathan said, it's accurate. Um, as a policymaker, though, the most important question I think you can ask beyond. Our, are, is development feasible under our, you know, under the rules we put in place? The most important question is, are developers the most likely buyers of any property that's for mm -hmm. sale mm -hmm. under the rules that we put in place? Mm -hmm. And my favorite example of this is the last project they did in Los Angeles. We converted a 60,000 square foot warehouse. So we did adaptive reuse on it. And, um, this was just before an affordable housing linkage fee was put in place that would have added about $500,000 to our development costs. 
And when I was looking at our deal, we, we were offering the maximum we possibly could for that property based on the residual land value calculation that you guys talked about. If, that, if, the, if the affordable housing linkage fee had been put in place, it would not have been true that we could have just offered a half million dollars less to the seller and they would have sold to us because they wanted to do a transaction. It would have been the case that the two other buyers that were vying for the property who were warehouse users, who would have kept the property exactly as it was with six jobs and nothing else there, they would have been the <laughs> ones who successfully won that, that contest. And so mm -hmm. I'd love, I, I, I'm very grateful that residual land value is entering into the con conversation and the understanding that developers and housing developers are not the only buyers who are out there. It's actually mostly people who are not housing developers who are trying to buy property. So you're in so so as a potential housing developer, you're often in competition with people uh, with other potential uses. And as zoning loosens up, that gets to be more and more the case, right? Absolutely. I can, absolutely. I can remember in Houston where I used to live, which has no zoning, uh, the affordable housing developers in particular were always struggling uh, with the fact that they were competing with non-residential buyers for prime pieces of property and they couldn't keep up. Absolutely. Um, and there's an assumption that if we just restrict zoning even more, that will restrict the pool of potential buyers to the point that will solve that problem. But I, I'd love to explode that myth uh, because the, <laughs> yeah, the, the going, as you said, you know, there's, there's a going concern on pretty much every property. And it doesn't necessarily mean if I'm if I'm trying to buy the car wash as a housing developer, uh, restricting the zoning just to what I do doesn't mean that I'm suddenly the only one vying for the property. It's probably going to be a car wash operator who's just going to keep the grandfathered use, who's mm -hmm. going to beat me out. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Heidi. Uh, speaking of uh, San Diego, so so San Diego has a reputation for has developed a reputation over the last few years, and especially since you've been planning director for policy innovation in housing. Um, and many uh, you have very aggressive ADUs. You've got a lot of streamlining, um, a lot of density bonuses around transit. How do you take development feasibility into account when you are um, working on bringing these changes to fruition? Um, thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, we do it in two ways. Uh, one is proactive and one is reactive. Um, oftentimes, um, and it depends um, on what initiative or proposal we're bringing forward, uh, but oftentimes we do um, use a bench of consultants, economic feasibility consultants, um, to run uh, sample projects and perform us uh, for us to make sure that uh, what we're bringing forward is going to work. Um, and um, so we do that formally um, through a bench of consultants that we have available to us. And we also do it informally. We have a number of developers um, that will share their performers um, with us. Um, sometimes they conflict with each other um, depending on <laughs> who you ask, um, but reviewing this information gives us good information um, to be able to tailor the policies and the regulations that we're drafting as we bring them forward to the decision makers. Um, the other thing that we do reactively is that we monitor the implementation of all of our programs on an annual basis. Uh, we do this through the same process that all jurisdictions are required to submit their housing data to the state. Uh, we then use that to tailor it to our specific jurisdiction. We prepare what we call an annual report on homes, um, and we look at the success of each of the housing programs that have been adopted over the past, I would say, maybe like five to seven years. Um, and we see what's working and what's not working. Um, and then we do annual um, land development code or zoning regulation updates um, to be able to tailor each of the regulations to address some of the things that maybe have gotten a project mm -hmm. stuck. Um, my staff is very in touch um, with uh, developers throughout the community. So we'll hear um, about um, you know, certain regulations that somebody got hung up on or something that would have made it more helpful. And that through our annual code update and through the monitoring, um, we can use um, to continually refine our regulations. But yeah, we've definitely found that static regulations um, are not helpful um, at all uh, because it's an ever-changing situation um, as many of the developers that are joining us on this call um, can attest to. And so we need to be nimble and keep up with that. What would be an example, Heidi, of, okay, you had a regulation out there or a policy change out there you heard from the developers that it wasn't working the way you expected. So in your annual code change, you went in and changed it in a way that made a difference. 
Yeah, so it, it can be little things, it can be big things, but it can just be, you know, little things like one of our um, development incentive programs um, requires the provision of an on-site promenade in public space um, in exchange for significant density bonus incentives. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had very specific regulations um, in those because we are always trying to make all of our uh, development projects be able to be processed by right ministerially. And with that comes very specific regulations. Um, so, you know, what we heard, you know, for the promenade, we had very specific um, length requirements, locational requirements, et cetera. Um, and we had a couple of projects that got hung up on that. Um, and so we were able to identify, you know, what if you have a corner lot and you can't, right. you know, abut right up, um, you know, to the street? And what if you want to do it on the opposite um, abutting corner of it? Can you do that too? And so that's, you know, where we have an opportunity to go back in, simply change the regulation. Um, most of the time, it continues to meet the same policy intent um, that the council originally approved. This just allows more things to happen so that we can realize the vision uh, that we had when we originally proposed. Great. Um, I wanted to go back and start asking some of the questions that that the audience is asking. And I want to go back to Mott and Jonathan and talk specifically about interest rates. <clears throat> interest rates have gone up a lot. That's killed some deals. Um, how is how has rising interest rates affected your ability to do deals and how far down are they going to have to come in order to make a difference and make deals fly again? How big of a factor is the interest rate in all this? Either one of you. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's huge. Um, it, it's huge because it, it affects kind of so many different things, right? So um, to, to it, it, number one, it affects your construction debt financing. So, you know, first of all, if we borrow 55%, just to say in David's example, that's $44 million, you have to pay interest on that. And so if if interest goes from, you know, 2% up to 8 or 9%, um, you can imagine what that does. Um you know, in terms of your ability to um, to finance a project, no no different than kind of housing affordability works for just a regular person. It, it, we're seeing that play out uh, just in mm -hmm. the uh, in in the in the real world in terms. You got to borrow money, and that costs right. money. And, and the right. higher the interest rate, the less you can borrow, et cetera. Exactly. And then then what we were saying again, what I was saying in, at the beginning about you know just the comparative. Um, uh, the, the comparative analysis that equity investors are, are doing in terms of you know where they want to channel their money on the inst on the institutional side. I mean, they don't have right. to um, invest in real estate. They can go to any other asset class that um, provides a better return or an equivalent return for a lower amount of risk. Uh, and so, you know, all that um, kind of conspires against you know uh, allowing projects to pencil in terms of how how they come down. Uh, how far they need to come down, I think that, that depends on a, a number of different things. And that, that's one of the things that's, you know, makes these things kind of complicated is that these projects are, you know, the aggregate of a bunch of different inputs, right? And so if right. we have construction costs that fall, um, you know, maybe we don't need interest rates to fall that much. If we have rents rise, maybe we don't need to have interest rates fall that much. So it, it's just a, it, it, it's so many different variables out there that are all kind of moving in concert. It's yeah. hard to really answer that question about how they, how much yeah. they need to fall, but they certainly need to having them fall well, certainly so. helps things out uh, <laughs> more than having them say where they are. Um, so. Yeah. Mont, uh, I'm sure fed chair Powell is tuning in and listening to your, to what you're both saying <laughs> about this. So, so Mont, what do you have to say about interest rates? Yeah. I, I, I I've got nothing to add to what Jonathan said about the interest rate, but you know, piling on to what Heidi brought up about the regulatory aspect of this, just to put it in context for everybody, if I've got a $10 million loan on a project, which is a pretty normal loan for a small, call it a 30, 40 unit project, uh, if interest rates are 4%, I'm paying about $1,000 a day just to be alive, just, just in terms of interest. If interest is 8%, everybody could do the math, you double that, it's about $2,000 a day just to be alive. And so in that kind of environment, uh, you know, add to that the cost of insurance, the cost of property taxes, all kinds of other things. In a city like San Diego, where the approvals are more or less ministerial, and I can expect to get to go in you know, 60, 90 days after submitting stuff, um, versus a city like Los Angeles, where it could take nine months or a year, just the waiting costs alone, I mean, every 30 days that I'm waiting at $2,000 a day adds $60,000 of costs to my, to my project. Um, and so little changes that cities can make to the 
to the regulatory pathway, to the approval pathway, getting an inspection a week faster, getting a, a, an approval letter two months faster. Th there's tens of thousands of dollars that can be found through things like that. And those are things that we control today despite interest rates. And those are the things we should be acting on today as a policy, uh, as a policy matter to make housing more feasible. Okay, uh, uh, let me pose another. I'm sorry, Jonathan, were you going to say something else? Yeah, I was just going to say just something quickly. You know, I, I, I'm not going to say that the capital markets sit around watching, you know, city council hearings, but I, they, they, <laughs> it does make an impression. Um, if they see that projects get rejected, for example, yeah. for, you know, spurious reasons, th that that actually does increase the cost of capital because they say that this is more risky. Um, and I and think so they're going to want a higher return. Correct. And I think, yeah. you know, folks are need to kind of understand how that plays out when when you do see projects getting rejected in, in ways that, you know, may not make a ton of sense. So. so a big institutional investor in that situation may well say, Texas is less risky. I'm going to Texas. And, right. to get, and I'll take a lower return in Texas right. because it's a more sure thing. Um, right. One question that came up uh, uh, this morning as I was talking to other people was, and I realize we have a ton of questions here, um, was do different types of investors have different return expectations and how does that play into projects? David's uh, model uh, in, assumes big institutional investors, but but many times with small infill projects, you've got small, sometimes quirky investors. Yeah. Sometimes they have believe they have a social impact um, a, a mission and might be willing to take a lower return, but in many cases, smaller investors actually might want a higher return. Does that play into your development feasibility of your, particularly your smaller infill projects? A hundred percent. And it's it, it's it's unpredictable how that cuts. Uh, when I graduated from uh, USC with my master of real estate development degree, they told us that after, every after learning after taking my class, by the way, after taking your class, it was <laughs> one of my favorite classes. Um, uh, the, the, you know, we we learned that institutional investors require a fifteen percent IRR internal rate of return, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to my first cocktail party with my then wife, uh, who's a doctor, and um, met a dentist who told me he was into real estate. And he, I said, so tell me about the deals you like to do. He's like, I got one deal where I'm earning 5%. And he was very proud of himself. And you know the difference between what we learned in school that investors need 15% and this guy that I meet at a party who needs 5% is very illustrative of the fact that there are different motivations out there, different investors out there, and it can cut either way. Um, very interesting. Uh, another question that's coming up a lot in the questions has to do with how you take long approval processes or possible NIMBY opposition into account. Mott, you talked about that a little bit um, in uh, in your discussion about how much a thousand costing you a thousand bucks a day, but uh, how, where does that go in the pro forma? How do you figure that out? And Heidi, I'm also wondering whether you've seen as you've moved, as Mott said, to many more ministerial approvals in San Diego, whether you've seen uh, uh, projects uh, pencil out for developers, particularly you have many wonderful small developers in San Diego, um, uh, because of because of this this these lengthy processes have have gone away. Jonathan, how do you account for that in your pro forma? Is that just time? It is. Well, I mean, I think it's it is a number of things. It's you know, uh, with any you know kind of large scale project, you know, you put together uh, an entitlement, you know. Um, schedule, a uh, development schedule, right? And you have to go out and, you know, talk to investors about that schedule and say, well, this is kind of what we see happening. And um, this is how long we think it may take. And it's different. Um, you know, that conversation is different. If you say, well, uh, statutorily, I can get my entitlements in 90 days, it's ministerial, it's just over the counter versus I have to go through a rezone, which is completely discretionary. And I've got to, you know, rely on, you know, four out of seven votes of council. And oh, by the way, the council could change, um, you know, in the next two years. I mean, so you're having multi, you're having just two, to, uh, a spectrum of, of, of conversations, but basically yeah. it's kind of understanding and that's where you kind of have to have that local understanding and, and knowledge about what you're actually going through what you what's what is um going to be demanded of you in terms of just exactions and things of that nature 
Um, and so you, 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 it is, it is kind of a time thing, but it's, it's, it's also reflected in risk. But I think that's the issue around the difficulties about SQL because nobody builds in a, a SQL lawsuit into their performance in essence, right? I, mean, I, think I thought that everybody <laughs> did. In yeah, yeah, yeah. John, 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 better, you're probably better developer. doing that. Um, but I think that's the thing. It's, you know, it, it, it it's just really more of a certainty thing and yeah. that certainty thing lowers yeah. the risk and that's kind of where it shows up. And, Heidi, and Bill, can I, can I, can I, can yeah, I that for just really, really fast, which is to say that um, every developer I know gets that wrong. They always vastly <laughs> underestimate the cost of entitlements and vastly underestimate the cost of the SQL settlement payments that they're forced to make, which in LA range between two fifty and $500,000 per project. Um, over the past 10 years, though, the market's appreciation and low interest rates have been extremely forgiving. And so it allowed people to be wildly wrong about the entitlement costs and still hit hit the ball out of the park on their projects. That is that the, those curves are reversing right now right. and people are really right. eating. It. Um, I was going to ask Heidi uh, uh, to this question of how you work uh, the, the entitlement process and possible opposition into your pro forma, from your perspective, what would be an example of a of a project which would have been a time consuming discretionary project back in those prehistoric days when I had your job versus um, versus now when you have more streamlined and ministerial projects? What kinds of things do you see happening now that didn't used to happen? Yeah. So, you know, in a lot of respects, you know, uh, we all want the same thing, right? Everybody that's coming from this, you know, wants the same thing with some exceptions, some wild, some wild exceptions, but, you know, we're all looking um, to see the production of more affordable homes located in the right areas aligned with our climate and equity goals across our city. And that's, you know, sort of the basic framework of what we're going through with all of our policies. Um, Part of that um, is providing certainty. And this is not just certainty to the developers, this is certainty to the community and the people that live in our city as well. Um, we Nobody gets certainty through the discretionary process, particularly with all of the lawsuits and um, processes um, that have been involved. Um, since Bill you know, was lost in, in my position, oh, it, it, it's the, the litigation has gotten worse. Um, we see on the, lawsuits, on the discretionary on, on the discretionary side. Yes, we get we we just basically just get hit all the time, um, and that breeds a lot of uncertainty. It has to affect the performas and you know the desire uh, to build in our city, which is something that we very much want and need to happen. Um, so part of that is putting forward um, these reforms that we've worked very hard to bring forward um, that take things that were through a discretionary process. Um, and identify through community input what it is that we are trying to see um, through these processes. I've been working at the city for a long time. You guys have seen this. Discretionary permits come with the same standard conditions on every single project. Um, most of the time, 95% of the conditions are not specific to the project. So it's really kind of getting down to what is the last little bit that we need to see in a project to feel comfortable allowing them to move forward without the uncertainty that comes along with that discretionary process. So that's what we do through our policy initiatives is uh, we you know, do community engagement. We hear from stakeholders, community members, um, nonprofit organizations, et cetera, um, to identify what do we want to see um, through these regulations. And that is provided clear and upfront. We do environmental review on that uh, programmatically and comprehensively um, so that we have the environmental review cleared uh, when we bring the comprehensive package to council um, and that allows projects to move forward with much more certainty. I do think um, that this has changed the game, um, this process, and it's not just in terms of how much more has been built, but it's how much more has been built that we wanted to see built also mm -hmm. um, as mm -hmm. a city because we do yeah. have those upfront and clear regulations. I, I would add, and this is kind of a question, Heidi, that um, one of the things you described is under is being able to analytically understand what all of your discretionary uh, uh, conditions of, add up to and figuring out how close that is to an essentially ministerial approval. Um, uh, it seems to me, uh, you're in a, a separate, you're not in the permit giving department, you're in the long, essentially the policy planning department. It seems to me that many cities just don't have that analytical capability to figure that out, particularly smaller cities, but, but given the difficulty everybody's having with hiring planners these days. 
Yeah, so we've put a lot of effort into hiring planners over the last year. My department is actually fully staffed, so um, that is definitely helpful. Um, we do work very closely with our development services department, who is our partnering partner, um, and my community planners are in um, contact um, with the permit planners that are issuing permits so that we know what is what is coming through, what is getting stuck, um, so that we can have that back and forth and understand uh, what we need to do. Um, but yes, having um, a planning and permitting staff that kind of understands the bigger picture of what yeah. we are trying to achieve is critical. Um, I'm gonna. We only have a couple minutes left, and there's a million questions. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna throw the bomb here and and ask uh, a question that was brought up uh, uh, in the Q and A, which is, what is the single as the final question? What is the single most impactful thing that can be done on the planning zoning side? To incentivize development in areas with high base land costs, we'll start. We'll start with the developers and then go to Heidi. Uh, Jonathan, what's the single most important thing that can be done on the planning zoning side to to make these projects work, particularly in areas like like uh, uh, where Turner Terrace would be built, you know, Rock Ridge or uptown Oakland or somewhere like that. I never like to do single uh, uh, questions <laughs> answers to questions, but. Um, you know, I, I definitely think, you know, um, you know, what Heidi outlined is huge. I mean, having certainty in your development process, um, I think, really goes a, a long way. And, and certainly um, also removing kind of the environmental review barriers. You know, I, I, I'm, a, um, I'm also sitting on the planning commission in the city of Oakland. And one of the things Oakland did pretty successfully in the last cycle was they did um, specific plans that had programmatic mm -hmm. IRs that... Um, basically took CEQA out of the picture. So it allowed for the streamlining um, of a lot of uh, development to go through um, under that, uh, that, that kind of programmatic EIR document. And so that really helped out, um, you know, and we also had the, the market kind of, you know, uh, be the wind in the sails to, to carry a lot of development through. But I think those things really can, um, can aid um, and um, okay. a, a projects. Uh, and Mott, quickly, what, what's the one thing? Or is there if a I magic, pick, is there if, a if I had to pick one thing it would be eliminating parking minimums. Mm -hmm. But if I were gonna speak more generally, I would say that cities should um go from a developer pays model of public good provision to an everybody pays model of developer good provision and do the feasibility analysis on your policies and determine whether it, it tips the scale in terms of uh status quo buyers like Will the car wash go to a car wash mm -hmm. operator yeah. or developer buyers? Will the car wash sell right. to a developer buyer? That's the analysis people. Should... Right. And and Heidi, last question, going to what Jonathan said, um, uh, your department is in charge of updating all the community plans, um, uh, of which there are 50 in the city of San Diego. Are you able to, to elevate a lot of this um, discretionary type discussion up to the plan level in the hopes of uh, streamlining the, the the permitting process itself is that working? Yeah, uh, we are, and we do, um, and uh, we have worked really hard to streamline um, how quickly we can update each of the city's community plans um, because it is simply a non-starter to be working off of twenty thirty year old um, community plans. Right. Community plans also come with implementation items, including zoning uh, that allows uh, for development to occur um, in accordance with. The, the plentiful existing regulations um, that we have. And so updating plans that have not been updated in you know, 15, 20, 25 years uh, really opens up new areas of the city um, for increased investment. And we've seen that, you know, we have some of our urban communities, um, the plans were updated in the last 10 years and that's where we're seeing the most growth right now, um, which is exactly right. where we want it. Great, well, I wanna say thank you to all of our, first of all, David, thank you for that wonderful presentation at the beginning. Thanks to the Turner Center for updating the the Making It Pencil. Uh, thanks to our panelists today from all over the state. This has been really great. I want to say thank you as well to um, I want to say thank you as well to the 400 people who attended today. Truly remarkable, <clears throat> David. We have lots of questions, many of which are very specific to you that we haven't answered. I'm hoping uh, some of those questions, as you pointed out, are answered uh, in the report, but perhaps we can capture the questions and try to answer them uh, on the Turner website as well. Yeah, that's my goal. I've been furiously trying to answer them. They're coming <laughs> in uh, very fast, but um, 
to the extent that there are more questions, please uh, refer to the resources we have on, on our website. Yeah. Um, we'll send out a recording as well. And uh, and yeah, happy to happy that this has been useful and of interest. And thank All you, right. Bill. Th thank you very much. And and uh, for everyone who joined in, thanks for joining us and and have a good rest of your day. So long.